All right, hello everyone. You can hear me in the back? Perfect. Okay, my name is Michael Frank. Thanks everyone for coming to the final Sports and Tech Team of the team. I'm um, really excited to dive into the discussion. Um, first, I want to give a big thanks to everyone who helped put this together. Um, first of all, a big thank you to the awesome folks from uh, Yahoo, Thuz, and uh, Quarter for hosting and sponsoring. Uh, this is the second event Quarter's hosted, and Quarter's a mobile gamification platform for live TV. It creates, manages, and monetizes second screen apps that allow millions of consumers to play along with their favorite shows and get rewarded for watching TV. Um, I've, you can play along with the games, man. Yes, you can play along with the game tonight. We might hear a little bit more about Quarter since their CEO, Carlos, is uh, sitting right next to me on the panel. Um, but uh, anyway, they're great, and it's awesome that they hosted us. Uh, oh, Thuz is the second time sponsor as well. Alex, uh, put your hand up somewhere if you want to learn more about Thuz. Uh, he's one of their employees over there. Uh, they're an award-winning uh, mobile and connected TV service, revolutionizing how sports fans discover and connect to sports programming. Um, they're integrated with a ton of different cable networks. I know they just integrated with Liberty Mobile, Liberty Global, and uh, their CEO one was on the panel uh, about a year ago, so they're great, and talk to him. And finally, uh, Yahoo Sports is sponsoring the event for the first time, which is great. Uh, you guys already know Yahoo's one of the most popular sports destinations on the internet. They have leading sports properties, including Yahoo Fantasy, Rivals, and a bunch of other stuff. And I know a lot of people here may be looking for jobs, and I know for a fact Yahoo Sports is hiring. So if you want to work at sports, go talk to Courtney. Courtney, I mean, Cortland. Cortland, put your hand up. Uh, go talk to that guy. Um, she's giving out jobs, maybe. Um, we were yeah. So. yeah, so there, there may be two companies that are recruiting here, or maybe even more. Um, in terms of the next panel, we'll post the event soon, uh, but put it on your calendars. We're going to be looking at the online and mobile ticketing space on January 7th. Um, and we still like to add someone who invests in that space, so if you have any friends or if you are interested in the mobile ticketing space, know it well, um, come talk to me. Um, and then we also announced an event in, for mid-March, um, where we're going to have a private chat with uh, Joe Lacob, who's the CEO of the, and owner of the Warriors, and he was also a uh, partner at Kleiner Perkins for a long time. Um, that event is going to be followed by going to the game, and they gave us a block of seats. It costs $20, uh, and there are a few seats left, uh, but only a few. So if that sounds fun, and it will be, um, buy tickets now. Um, and finally, uh, tweet about this event. It's great when uh, we tweet uh, because then we get a record and I get feedback about what people like. Uh, hashtag sports and tech, so S-P-O-R-T-S-A-N-D-T-C-H is great. All right, that was fun, but now on to the panel. Um, we have an awesome four panelists tonight, as always. Uh, to my left, uh, we have Carlos Diaz. He's the CEO and founder of Quarter. Um, to his left, we have Chris Gargano. Chris is the Senior Director of Marketing and Entertainment for the uh, San Francisco Giants. And he's the former Director of Broadcasting for the Oakland Raiders. Uh, to his left is Dave Silverman. Um, he's a partner at Comcast Ventures. And I just spoke, spoke to him. Uh, his first investment there was in uh, a little company called Box Media that's now a much bigger company that uh, created support for SB Nation and is now a pretty big global media property. And then to his left is uh, Jen Franklin, who's the VP of Digital at Comcast Sports in that Bay Area. And big thanks to Jen. Um, he did pretty much most of the work of, on this panel, just organizing people. <laughs> so if you guys want to be on a panel, just do what you did. Say, I have a great idea for a panel, and I'll get two of my friends to be on it, too. Uh, I uh, usually say what teams everyone likes, but honestly, I forgot. So please, when you answer the first question, mention your uh, favorite teams so you can be polarized. Uh, <laughs> all right, so anyway, so now talking about real stuff, uh, I think the biggest thing that we talk about in pretty much every conversation, whether it's about sports or anything else related to tech, is around mobile consumption. Uh, so I, the big question is, this panel is all about sort of TV and video and where's it going. And I'd say mobile is one of the most transformational shifts. So basically, how is that affecting uh, the business you work in or the business you started? And we could go down the line or anyone who feels
strongly can jump in. All right, um, I'm Chris. I work for the Giants. My favorite team is the Giants. <laughs> I'm to say that. <laughs> but I also like the Raiders, the Warriors. I'm a Bay Area guy. Um, to answer your question, Michael, you know, you look at mobile, and it drives. You know, you can look at it a lot of different ways. We have MLB.tv, which is an MLB initiative where you can watch all the games every night. I don't know if you guys have that, but it's unbelievable. You can be sitting in your living room and watching the Yankees play the Red Sox or Pittsburgh playing um, the Cardinals. It's tremendous, and that's on the league-wide level, but I'm obviously with a club. So how does it help us? We promote a lot of our broadcast content, which we produce for the Giants, it's SFG Productions. That's the, the group that I oversee. We produce a lot of TV shows and short features that both live on the web and air on Gen Station. I've been friends a long time, so I give her the content. She loves it, I hope. And what we do is we have, say, we'll have a short feature on a TV show that we're, you know, talking about. So you'll see the short feature. Oh, that's cool. You'll tweet about it. You'll send out the link, and then you'll watch the debut or watch it on sfgiants.com. So I'm sure this will be the flow of the conversation, but... The way you can promote with mobile devices to debuts of TV shows or debuts of online properties or live streaming events is unbelievable. And we take a lot of pride in how we do it for the Giants because we produce so much content, we don't want anyone missing it. So we're very, very active in mobile. And again, we could spend the entire conversation on that one question, but there's a lot of other topics to be discussed. So I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Uh, so Dave Goldman, as Mike mentioned. So I'll start with a quick little... Action. What's your favorite team? Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, a quick little story. Uh, so, before I joined Comcast Ventures about eight years ago, <laughs> I that was it. Now, just, just to disclose that, in fact, tonight we have a commercial during the game for Bud Light, and I've got all the DevOps in the back end of this room, you know. Just praying for the servers to support you. Know, all. So maybe something happened, you know. What I mean? Sorry. Go to that. So uh, before I joined, about eight years ago, I was at a wireless infrastructure startup. We were developing a mobile broadband technology, and I remember back in 2002, sitting in a meeting with the CTO of Deutsche Telekom in Bonn, Germany, pitching our wares and how great mobile broadband is, and how popular and how powerful it is. And the CTO said, wow, that's really incredible technology, a mega and a half of sustained throughput and a downlink, that's really neat, but how would consumers ever use this? Why would anyone want a mobile broadband experience? What are the applications? And so brainstorming, trying to come up with applications, obviously video was one of them, just completely dismissed, and needless to say that meeting went nowhere. So to have this conversation and to talk about the impact that mobile is having is, is really heartwarming for me, for no other reason to say you were wrong. <laughs> so, uh, you know, how mobile is impacting our lives? I mean, you know, we all read the news, we've all seen exponential mobile growth and um, online shopping this past Friday, Black Friday, 50% of the traffic was mobile. Uh, Cisco's visual networking index, mobile video is growing by I don't know, a gazillion percent or something outrageous. So it's clearly penetrating our everyday lives. We all walk around, I'm sure, in this room with multiple mobile devices, I think that's three or four wireless devices with me at all time. And so from an investor's perspective, looking at technology companies, looking at content production companies, being on the board of Vox Media, everything is about mobile in the way that content is produced, in the way that content is delivered, in the way that content is monetized. Um, we'll, we spend a lot of time at Vox with responsive design, ensuring that the content is presented as well as on mobile as it is on any other desktop platform. Um, mobile video is actually monetizing pretty darn well, uh, almost as well as gaming. Uh, so we're, we're actually seeing revenue opportunity with mobile and mobile video. So there's a tremendous force um, from an investor's perspective, from an entrepreneurial perspective that we see, from Comcast perspective, we can talk about what Comcast is doing with mobile as well. But it is absolutely a part of every decision-making uh, process, which is how do we build for mobile, how do we ensure that that mobile experience is on par, if not better, than desktop TV or any other experience that we develop. I'll hop in. So I'm Jen. I, I can't tell you my favorite team because, again, I, I can't polarize the audience. We broadcast every single uh, A's game, Warriors game, Sharks game. I will get a phone call from my boss and will inevitably say, 
see it on Twitter, but I've disclosed that information. So I'll say that my favorite team was the 1957. Um, Just Milwaukee. say you rhymed with. No. Milwaukee Braves, because my great grandfather was a skipper and that team won the World Series. So I will go with that. Um, and it's a great segue. I mean, we're obviously the television home of these Bay Area sports teams, and historically, you know, uh, ratings, revenue, everything projected around the television. And I've got a very grandfathered um, staff that's used to selling linear, that's used to pr producing for television, um, that has 100% changed now with mobile. Uh, as we look at OASD for live streaming, which we think is the next, um, you know, sort of hop into technology. Um, there's a million models that have been tested. How do consumers get these games? I mean, show of hands, how many people could find a Monday Night Football game online right now? <laughs> Just like finding a bootlegged link. Um, so if we're getting into that space, what does that mean for security and what's the regulatory, you know, functions around it? But all these conversations swirl around because you can't just be a television programmer anymore. We can't just market it. Um, to the person that's, you know, sitting and watching the games with their buddy, um, because let's face it, we are constantly texting, we're constantly tweeting, we're constantly in this space. So it's been fascinating to see how our producers and how, you know, friends like Chris at the Giants are now, you know, literally tailoring their content just to mobile. How do you personalize it? How do you come up with an environment that's, you know, this is my TV, this is my content that I've chosen to watch. Um, it's a very intimate experience that goes beyond just inviting the broadcaster into your uh, into your living room. So it's a privilege to be in that space, but it comes with a lot of responsibility. So I think we're still trying to tweak the model and figure out how to do it. Um, but it should be a big year. 2014 should be a big year for us with mobile and live streaming. Yeah, so um, my favorite team is uh, the Barcelona. The Barcelona. I come from Europe, so sorry. <laughs> So, I support, you know, soccer, soccer teams, so FC Barcelona. Uh, yeah, so what is interesting with uh, mobile is, uh, obviously, you know, it's a new way of watching TV, but I think that what is more interesting is mobile brings the capacity we have to participate you know, on TV. Uh, obviously, we're talking about, uh, a lot about, you know, social TV, what is about engaging the conversation, about the show we're watching on TV with all the people. Uh, what we try to focus on in our core is the next level is about you know, not only about talking about what you're watching on TV, but who you participate in the content you're watching on TV, and try to make this uh, this experience a real interactive experience. We've been talking a lot about interactive TV in the last years. Nobody could really find a way to make it, and I think that mobile is bringing a new tool, you know, and a new, very interesting way to because interactive is in our pocket. You know, I mean, uh, you can make a a micro a microwave of it you know, interactive, but it doesn't make any sense. You know? And I think that making the TV interactive doesn't make any sense. Uh, TV is basically a screen. You know? I mean, and so uh, the interactivity relies on your phone and the mobile, and it brings a lot of capacity. And that's what we're trying to do at Core is really to make a social experience, of course, but also a very interactive experience so you can participate in the game. Obviously, we, care, we think that gamification is a very interesting way to increase and improve the level of engagement of people when they're watching something on TV. Imagine if we can turn you know, any game you're watching on TV into your game that you can play with your friends, and that's what, we, uh, what we're trying to do, and it's a wide open option, you know, so there is uh, everything to invent. We try to invent that, so if you like you know, this, uh, uh, this way of thinking, and if you want to be part of that, you know, just join us. You know, we're looking for, if you're a developer, join us now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so can we create a little debate and controversy? I would right. agree with that. So, so I'll, I'll just re react to Carl's your comment about interactivity. Um, I actually don't believe that there is a single killer platform, whether it be mobile, whether it be TV, whether it be PC, for interactivity. There are various types of interactivity. I think the television could be a platform for interactivity. Obviously, from a Comcast perspective, we're biased. Uh, X1, which is the new platform, I don't know how many people have the X1 box at home, but the ability to publish apps, the ability to interact in a very different way than what Quarta does is, is, is a very real aspect of X1. Pulling up sports scores, pulling up quick stats, it's not the same level of interactivity that Quarta presents, and, and Quarta is a great solution. In, it's a much more immersive, much more involved interactive experience than just simply while you're watching the Giants game, pull up the scores from FC Barcelona or you know, whatever else you're interested in. 
Uh, but that's still interactivity. That's not a lean back experience. That's much more of a lean forward experience. And so I think, you know, as, as viewers, I, I, I doubt any of us sit there with just a television. We all have multiple devices. Um, some of that would be performed optimally through a mobile. Some would not. Okay, so um, thinking about what both Carlos and uh, Dave just said, I think this is a good segue. So there's been, there's been a lot of money and a lot of smart people who have tried to make these sort of quote unquote second screen, screen interactive apps, and a lot of that money's been lost so, so far. Um, I mean, Quarterdeck have done a pretty nice job, and the folks at Twitter have done a pretty nice job. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I mean, I don't on a regular basis do anything else. Um, so thinking about, and I think part of that. Um, sort of goes back to the people who are creating the content. You know, the San Francisco Giants and the podcast people sort of saying, okay, this is compelling enough to us that we're going to push this and we're going to integrate this. Um, how do you guys think about the second screen and sort of both what you've liked so far and sort of the opportunities you see there to enhance content for you? You know, this is such a, these are great topics. One of the things that the second screen is so personal. You know, to your point, it's so personal. Some folks like to, is this second screen? Let's define it. You know, you're on your Twitter feed, you're tweeting about the program you're watching to your one friend. It's interactive, you're still engaging, but you're limiting it to one audience. Some have a group of friends, some prefer Facebook, some prefer to post a quote from or a, a, a sound bite or something from the show. I just think, you know, Michael, to your point, it's like, how do you monetize this? It's so personal. So maybe, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, you create something that is a personal, you know, cue where whatever this person's activity is is measured and therefore monetized. I'm coming up with some off the top of my head because, as you said, Michael, so many people have failed at this. But because it's so personal, you know, we try to make sure that we have something so compelling that we'll take it beyond one person, or it's 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 the, your giant network per se. So if we're producing a great TV show or a short or we're scripting something. We're going to give you just enough so where it's so good, you're going to tweet it out to the masses. And I, you, there's tweet. I mean, there's Twitter. They're just doing a great job at it. Let's just be honest. I mean, you, the question that you posed to us is, and you know, your company as well, these people are doing a great job because they're allowing the forum, the 140 characters, is concise. It's your ability to share a link. It's your ability to share a photo. And it's, there's a model, uh, but how to monetize it, I think we I don't know, and you know, I'm in the business of content producing and getting the eyeballs, but monetizing that's for someone that's a lot smarter than me. <laughs> you know, this is such, we talk about this every day. You know, we've got the first screen, which is great. People are watching Giants games or they're going to bars and they're, you know, aggregating around Kirk and Kike and um, uh, using Giants very specifically too, by the way. It's not a hint to my favorite team, by the way. I <laughs> um, <laughs> this. Um, but this this gets me every time, you know, how many different places do I want to send the audience knowing that I've got, you know, a, a footprint of three million people in the Bay Area that I can very quickly say, I need you to, you know, hop over here and join this talent conversation. I think at the end of the day, we're a company like ours, which is trusted, it's authentic, we like to um, provide the commentary from a, a voice that's trusted, again, you've invited us into our homes. Um, so it's something we take very seriously. What is that content? I, I don't want it just to be, you know, go to Facebook, go to Twitter, you know, leave a comment here. We're trying to find value in that second screen, um, but also not splinter the audience. So I think it's the $50 million question, um, not to harp on our live streaming, but, you know, that's kind of the goal, uh, just to aggregate the audience in a digital environment, but also supplement that content. How do you keep them on your product knowing that, you know, go all over the place. What's that extra something, that extra um, the extra muster, if you will, um, to, to keep them coming? So we haven't found the, the special secret sauce yet, for sure. Okay, so just to go to Carlos for a quick sec, because like a lot of what we're talking about, interesting, there's interesting answers, but it's like a pr pretty high level. Um, so if, if, um, I'm the CEO of Quarter, and I'm going to you know, go pitch Comcast Sportsnet. Um, what are the metrics I'm focused on? I'm saying this is going to affect your business. And that's why or any second screen after it might not have to be quarter. Well, yeah, I, I can give you some examples, you know, brands, you know, right now when we sign deal with the Bud Light, the Wiser, Corona, or Dave and Boosters, and what they're doing, you know, is a uh, solution like, uh, I don't like, you know, the term second screen because I don't know when the first screen and when the second screen goes. For some generation, I, I, the second screen is their first screen. And I won't reveal you the number of people that are 
playing chord would be the unfortunate to be routine because every song, you know. But uh, uh, but uh, what is interesting as a brand, you know, is that it's really about you know interacting with uh, with the TV viewers at specific moment that you cannot do you know, on TV. So how can I tie my brand at a moment of a touchdown? I know that I will never have a commercial you know, at this moment. And I will never have my commercial on air you know, at this specific moment. But on the mobile, at this specific moment, I can bring something. You know, I can create an interactivity, an interaction you know, with the TV viewers. I can add them you know, to rate you know, this moment. How, how, much, how, much, how many points do you give you know, to this touchdown? Stuff like that. And really get the brand you know, tied to the specific moment of a show. Could be on sports, you can imagine. We did an operation last year with uh, Domino's Pizza. Every time they were home run, you know, Giants game, uh, you had a Domino's Pizza flying a trophy, flying across the screen. The first 100 people you know, to catch this trophy was just a five seconds you know, flying trophy. If you catch a trophy you know, on time, you get a free pizza, and the guy delivered the pizza at home you know, before the game ended. So in that, in that's a very interesting way also to reinvent advertising, you know, and, 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 and do stuff that you cannot do you know, on TV. And uh, that doesn't have to be you know, a, a substitution you know, of uh, what you're doing on TV. That can also enhance you know, your commercials on TV. What about you know, polling the viewers like David Buster is doing, where there is David Buster commercial on air. They ask you the question right at this moment, what do you prefer at David Buster's on game day? And if you answer food, we're going to give you a coupon for food. If you answer beverage, we're going to give you a beverage new coupon at this moment. And the, 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 the level of uh, 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 redemption of this coupon is super high. You know, we've got 30 or 40 percent of the people redeeming this coupon at this specific moment because we bring them the right thing at the right moment. And I think that's something that you cannot do you know, on TV, that you can do with mobile. But it did, one more time, you know, it's not a competition in between TV and mobile. It has to be you know, TV plus mobile, and there is a ton of things to do you know, together. So just to sort of shift gears, uh, one of the things that I think is pretty interesting, um, kind of talking about video, is how to how to deal with YouTube. And I think um, <laughs> that's S one billion dollar question. Okay, um, and I, I imagine for, for broadcasters for the for the SB Nation. Um, it, this is especially sort of critical to you because yeah. your content is how you monetize. Um, and I, I imagine it probably affects Comcast Sports at some, and the Giants probably a little less, but it affects you guys as well. How do you, I mean, YouTube obviously, I don't know what the number is, it's 800 million or a billion, but it, it's a lot of people, and it's a lot of market share, and it's pretty established, but it's pretty hard to monetize. Um, but how do you think of it strategically? Okay. I, I thank YouTube for all of those entities that you mentioned, from Fox to Comcast to the Jimmy Fallon show, which is an NBC property, is critical, uh, whether it be for brand development, whether it be for monetization. We, there, there's no denying that YouTube is a massive, massive platform, massive reach. If you look at the quality of content on YouTube, it is evolving. It's not the dog on a skateboard content. It is professional, high quality content. Content providers are embracing YouTube, using that as a distribution medium. You know, Jimmy Fallon has done really, really well in developing the brand, you know, partially because of YouTube. Um, with, from Vox Media perspective, they distribute a ton of content on YouTube. Some of it is monetized, some of it is not monetized, but it just further develops their brand. We at Comcast Ventures invested in a company called Full Screen Media three months ago, four months ago or so, whatever it is, and it's to help high quality content producers uh, develop their content, monetize their content, that full screen creates virtual channels around specific genres and topics, and there are incredible amounts of views on that platform, and that's just YouTube, one medium. So I, I think for those that still ignore or put their head in the sand about YouTube, it will be run over. Uh, you just cannot ignore it. Yeah, obviously the, the huge issue with us and, and emerging platforms, whether YouTube or Apple TV or you know whatever, you can think of the next great big thing. And I love, you know, I've got a Chromecast at home and I think it's the best thing that I've ever bought for $35. But, you know, we pay a lot of money to leagues and teams and to retaining our sports rights is something that's very, very valuable to us. Um, not only obviously financially, but from a brand standpoint. And, 
uh, building up the equity that we have in markets across the country. Chicago, Philadelphia has been around forever. So, you know, just offering up highlights, which frankly we don't even have the rights to do. Somebody like the Giants could do that, but we don't own any of the digital rights. Um, you know, I, we just don't have that kind of like flexibility right now. Um, we will in the future. I mean, obviously, you take a look at your crystal ball, and if you aren't on those platforms, like uh, Dave was saying, if you ignore them, you're dead in the water. So, you know, we're, we're sticking our toes in. We're doing things like hangouts, or, you know, we're sort of putting some commercials on YouTube and, and seeing where we do get some traction. But as far as streaming and, you know, what our core product is, we just, we're, you, the industry and the league standards right now are just so murky. And, um, sports rights, we're all in the wrong business. We all should be, you know, collecting checks from the um, TV broadcasters because it's still a very, very, very lucrative space to be in. Um, so, if I'm the Giants right now, uh, obviously we talked about kind of how, I guess, you just want to say basically is that we're going to get into kind of mobile enabled social, if that makes sense. Like, um, I imagine sort of the content that's shareable on YouTube and that's you know, engageable on YouTube is probably somewhat different than the content that's engageable on you know, a two-hour broadcast. How has that sort of changed the way you guys have done your job on the content creation side, Chris? Just being honest with you, we're pretty limited with YouTube. It's an MLB initiative. Um, we can't do much in that space. It's, just, uh, it's progressing and they're working on it in New York, obviously. Um, but. No, you're right. I mean, the, I mean, from a personal standpoint, I mean, YouTube's amazing. I mean, the possibilities are endless. But, you know, I have to populate sfgiants.com right now, and that's where my primary responsibilities are. But, you know, I can't really speak on YouTube. If you're kind of getting my drift here, you know, there's some initiatives being worked on right now. So i got to leave it at that. i got to pass on this one. you got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, so this is probably the question... Uh, Mostly for Dave, but anyone else can chime in. So one of the sort of old, I think probably, I'd say stupid adages was VCs don't invest in content. Um, and I think that that was, what people really want to say is VCs don't invest in things that don't systematically grow. Um, but you know, content still show up that, that you can't systematically grow. Um, anyway, we're, we're, regardless of whatever that is, we're definitely certainly seeing you at least invest in the box media. And we're seeing more investments in content. Um, what are the sort of attributes that uh, kind of make that attractive? It seems like maybe you make that kind of increasingly more attractive, um, at least in Fox's case. And do you think, yeah, what are those basically first? And do you think those are going to kind of um, also expand more towards sports stuff in general? Yeah. So I, they're, they're ha I mean, if you're right, the, the general comment among investors is that content is really difficult to scale because you need human power to grow that. Uh, but yet there have been a number of successful our companies, HuffPo, Bleacher Report, Say Media, BuzzFeed, Box, I can't include in that category, Business Insider, lots of successful scale content companies. And if you look at them, they all have a few similar attributes in mind. You know, obviously, uh, content production, high quality content production, we at Box take that very, very seriously, as do all of the other brands that I mentioned. Uh, but it's a low cost content production model. It's how do we take what traditionally has been very, very expensive to produce, whether it be video content or written content, and change it so that it is more cost effective. Because the way you do that is not by paying people less, but leading with technology. So I'll speak to Vox Media in that we've invested tremendously into building a next generation media stack, which is a fancy way of saying a really advanced CMS platform. And that CMS platform, that media stack that they've developed, allows them to enable their writers to produce content, not to worry with the backend technology platform. The writers do what they do best, um, and they're empowered with that, that sophistication on the technology platform. We at Vox Media have a very advanced um, uh, media organization, uh, advertising organization, ad opt organization. So it's also changing that ad model on its head as well. Um, Vox sells predominantly direct, predominantly on their own, but they sell on a campaign basis. So if you look at the ads, they're not the, you know, the banner ads, they're not IAV units, they're very rich experiences, they're very custom built for their advertisers that are willing to pay brand dollars, not performance based dollars. It's a very, very different camp that they're in, but that's because A, it's a high quality content, they're able to achieve high quality content because of technology, but the ad ops team and the creative team is able to generate a very rich ad experience for the brands, and so, 
all of those components together make for a successful media company. Um, and there are other examples. It's not just Fox, but Fox obviously applies to those. Sure, uh, that makes a ton of sense. So I think I understood. I still don't totally understand exactly what this sort of special CMS that they have uh, does, but my sort of the key takeaway that I took was, please respond to that, um, was find margin in content, and the two, they sort of being able to find like margin, so to speak, in content. Um, so, it, so, so, so it's certainly around content production, but it's also about content distribution. How do you get the social aspects built into that content? How do you get all the images easily accessible? You don't have to worry about the formatting of the page. You don't have to worry about cropping the images, or how do you uh, make it uh, applicable? How do you change the, the headings on the stories so that they fit into a, a Twitter environment? They generate a ton of traffic through Twitter. We talk about Twitter and the power of Twitter. But there's an art to how do you produce content that resonates through Twitter? How do you drive that traffic through social in general? And all of that is built into that CMS platform. We've had people interested in licensing that media stack from Vox, which is not the business that we're in. Um, but you know, WordPress is a great platform for the masses, but not for high quality content production that advertisers are spending lots of money with. And just to chime in, sorry not to cut you off, but I think on, you know, obviously from an investment standpoint, it's companies looking at high quality, but it's also partnerships. You know, NBC Sports just did one with Yahoo Sports, and you don't think for a minute Yahoo didn't want to get into the content game and get access to some of those rights. Um, you know, you look at a company like Facebook that's reinventing their news feed and everybody wants to be high quality, high quality, high quality. So if you don't have the you know, sort of chutzpah and the um, actual resources to get that done, um, you gotta figure that technology companies are looking after, um, you know, Google going after the NFL or something like that in the future that's gonna um, dramatically shift the sports landscape and merge it even closer to the tech landscape. I was talking with a, uh, an executive at the broadcast group, and uh, one thing he was saying that was very interesting was like, uh, as a broadcasters, we've got the best content on earth. Uh, that's pretty sure. The best content. And when people say, I don't watch TV anymore, you know, I mean, uh, this is not true. You're, you're watching you know, TV maybe on on the internet, you know, and uh, you're watching TV, you're not maybe watching the TV device, but you're watching TV. So we've got the best content on earth. The problem is that uh, we don't have any data. You know, well, we don't have a lot of data. You know, when you look at social networks, they don't have any content, but they have all the data. You know, they know everything you know, about every user, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a perfect mix. You know, I mean, uh, imagine now that we can bring together these two strengths. You know, I mean, uh, the content, the high quality content, because nobody else than Hollywood you know, can produce this content you know, right now. Mm. Okay, there is Netflix. You know, they did something. You know, of course, that's a big alert. You know, for the broadcasters, by the way. But uh, that one, that will not happen. You know, in the next year, you will see you know, all the digital players producing this content. At least you have a little bit of a dent you know, on that. Keep it, keep it. You know. uh, but uh, imagine if we mix, you know, the data science, you know, that the social networks have, you know, with your content. Because Netflix is a data company, by the way. It's all about data. It's not about content. It's very interesting to me. Putting that together. Yeah, so um, so we've talked about uh, a little bit about the sort of innovation going on in so far. Uh, beyond uh, Fox Media and Quarter, what are the companies that you think are doing sort of really interesting things in this space? Uh, on the second screen space? No, uh, in sort of, I'd say, in media. But, so I'd say sports media in general, but particularly uh, in the sort of TV and radio space. Wow, well, Fuse is doing a very good thing. You know, I mean, I, I mean, it's not because it's sponsored tonight, you know, but uh, really, you know, I mean, I really, uh, really like you know, what they're doing. There is another company, I don't know if you invested in this company, named Box Station in Palo Alto, uh, that they're doing, uh, uh, they're trying to uh, create a, a, an index of TV. So you can search TV in real time. So basically, they take the closed caption. And they index, you know, the closed caption in real time, so you basically can search. It's like a Google for TV. That's really interesting. Yeah, they index all the metadata. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, that's that's yeah, very interesting. Content is copyrighted, though, but that's the issue they run into. Oh uh, yeah, really? Yeah. Closed captioning is copyrighted. Yeah. Well, well, you know, coming from the digital space and dealing, you know, with uh, broadcasters, <laughs> you know what I used to say, you know, uh, TV is a is a box, you know, super locked. 
with a ton of money inside. Uh, so as a digital player, we do want to be inside the box. So you have to deal with all these problems. But if you can deal with all these problems, yes, you get access to the money. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, look, if you bring online analytics to TV and provide the same level of measurability and engagement, you know, you can only imagine what the CPMs would be on television, right? I mean, advertisers really know, to be honest, very little about who's watching that content, how are they engaging. They do a lot of efficacy studies and a whole bunch of other experiments that really are just experiments. Online, you really know everything. Uh, so it's incredibly powerful if you can merge those two, those two worlds. Right, that's what uh, the company Twitter bought Bob Lupin, I think, was trying to do. Uh, but you know what is very interesting with Twitter is that Twitter has been the first player that has been able to demonstrate that they can take money from the TV and bring that to the digital space. What they're doing right now with this Amplify you know, program, the first you know, digital player to take money out of the TV advertisement and bring that to the digital space. This is remarkable. You know, I mean, I, we can argue about the $18 billion in our innovation, but just doing that you know, in just one year or 18 months or something like that, this is good. And everything that goes into it, I guess, you know, like I said before, some of the sports rights, the clearances that you have to get with the leagues and the Twitters and the content providers and, um, you know, companies uh, that interest me right now are on a real operational standpoint. It's how do you actually power the technology? How do you get those highlights on Twitter so that you can tell your third party that you know, you're going to wrap your brand around it? But I have to deliver that within 30 seconds. So, you know, we've got partnerships with a company called Snappy TV that you know, just captures um, video, and I've, it's incredible the demo, demos that I've seen. We're doing this right now with the Premier League, um, and literally, it's a goal happens, and a minute later, you can you know, watch it on your platform. So that's really exciting to me. Just you know, ten years ago, when I was a video editor, you know, producing commercials for CSN, and you have to wait, you know, ten minutes to get your thirty-second clip turned around. Those days are long gone. It's just going to get faster from there. Okay, uh, Chris. Uh, yes. If, if, you, if you don't if you don't have a favorite company, then I think they sort of identify some kind of gaps in the marketplace you know, around analytics. What 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 company would you like to see that else? If there is like sort of a particular tool or company that you really love right now. Well, you know what's interesting is is what you said, Dave, about um, you know measuring advertisers within, in my world, live sporting events. They say that live sporting events are the only DVR proof uh, programming that's on TV right now. That's why the rates are, the rights fees are going up so high. So I'm sure if you could give a return on investment to these advertisers, you know, they get the, the metrics of the ratings, you know, there's 17 million people watching this program. But you're right, do they, do they watch your exact spot? It's, the television was invented in this town in 1939, right? By low T. Farnsworth. Well, all those years ago, we still, we still don't know, really, who's watching spots. We can guess, so we can charge this premium, right? There's a lot of eyeballs, let's say half of them. Let's say a third of them are watching. Well, I don't know what a third of the 17 is, is but what is it, 4.5, whatever, I don't know, it's a little over 5 or 16. You know what I mean, guys. Yeah, so if there's a company, don't know, you know. right, so if there's a company, like yeah, I work in sports. One strike, you're out. Counts it for anything. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, if there was a company that could actually measure those eyeballs, that would be off the charts. Because then the sports rights would go up, I'd have job security, and you know, 14 more professional teams in town. Now, you know what I'm saying? That would be very, very compelling. Because uh, you know that, that would be something that you know, then you would really have something going. Everyone says, you know, Jen, you, you know, where's TV going? Well, in our world, it's going in a nice direction because of the fact that you know live sporting events still attract a certain type of viewer, and they're not going anywhere. Not on the way. Okay. Um, so going back to sort of uh, innovating in traditional media, uh, this is probably a personal spot for me. Um, I bought a website, a URL called notjoebot.com, one, one, one the night. Uh, so basically, uh, I think that sort of broadcasting, I mean, you see a lot of the guys who broadcast games now, obviously, if you read broadcast games 40 years ago, um, but some of the tools are different. Uh, you know, the obvious ones are like, there's yellow, black, and red sports too. But there's some uh, kind of less obvious stuff. How is broadcasting changing for you guys, and where do you see it going? 
So we've kind of alluded to this, you guys, throughout the course of the night. There's been references to content. Call me old-fashioned, but I always believe that good content will find eyeballs. Do you, do you not agree with me? I think that good, compelling content, whether it's live or documentary or talk shows, will find eyeballs. It's just a matter of marketing it, marketing it properly and getting it out to the masses. Um, and I think people are getting more savvy at producing content. I think the camera angle that you see, Jay and I were just watching our buddy from Comcast, we're just watching Monday Night Football, and they have low angles, they have super slow-mos. Remember when Hunter Pence hit that ball in the NLCS in 2012? You saw the ball hit the bat three times? That's an innovation, that's a super slow-mo. That would make me want to watch. That was, we ran that 400 times, I mean, you know, in our replays of, in our documentaries and such. So to answer your question, I think people are getting more savvy with how they present content, whether it's super slow-mos, 4K technology, uh, tight shots, camera placements, miking people on the sidelines, miking catchers, miking umpires. I mean, I love that stuff, going behind the scenes, taking it to the next level, not just surface broadcasting, but in-depth broadcasting. And I'm not talking about Tom Brokaw in depth, I'm talking about what, is, what does it sound like when the guy's foot hits the base? Well, they have mics in there now. That didn't happen two years ago. You know, if you watch a Fox broadcast of a playoff game, you're feeling like you're part of it, not only visually, but in the audio sense as well. So those are innovations. Yeah, but that's a very good question, because in fact, the problem is that I think that TV, yes, maybe there is innovation on TV. The problem is that innovation on mobile is going faster right, than the innovation you know, on the TV space. You know, the, the last innovation for me on TV was a DVR, and that was 10 years ago. You know? when in 10 years, look at what happened on the mobile space. And the problem is that if you want to mix you know, these two things together, the problem is that one is running, the other one is making a moonwalk, you know, and something like that. You know, it seems to move, but in fact, it's going in the back. You know. Well, a little bit of a that. But uh, uh, yeah, I think that mobile is bringing so much innovation right now that it's very difficult. We're talking with broadcasters every day. And sometimes we pick them with stuff, you know, they're like, oh my God, you, you're talking about you know, something that won't happen before, you know, 10 years. I'm like, no, it's going to happen next year. And they don't realize that. And if you look at who were the giants, you know, who were the rock stars, you know, seven years ago. We are on 2013 still. So imagine what would be TV in 2020 or what would be, you know, the space you know, in 2020. Look at who was the rock star. Seven years ago, MySpace, EA Games, EA Sports, you know? um, who was that? Motorola, Nokia, Microsoft. They were the rock stars. You know, look at them, you know, right now, seven years after. So look at what would be the space in mean, seven years, you know. So it's, it's going to move very fast, and I hope, you know, that broadcasters and all these uh, industry will move at the same pace, you know, because if they don't, you know, that would be a tremendous, you know, storm. I think where the hesitation, at least out of the gate, going game busters and, you know, television traditionally and sports broadcasting in particular, um, again, I've alluded to this, you let us into your home, the storytelling aspect of it is so, so important and so valuable, and you take it. You know, what do you do when you get home? You take off your shoes, you crack open a beer, and you want to watch the, the game. Um, is it traditional? Absolutely. Um, do these broadcasters need to innovate and get with the times? Yes. But there's something tribal um, about sports that just sort of makes you want to sit around the kitchen table and uh, enjoy that moment. Um, that's probably not a very popular thing to say in Silicon Valley when we're all so tuned in and wired in. And, um, constantly trying to come up with that ne next big thing. So I think where broadcasters, at least in the short term, can do a lot better job is ingraining those storylines that come up on social. Uh, what is the buzz of the game? What are people actually talking about? What are they betting on uh, you know, during the game with their friends? I mean, how do you envelope that into the storyline of the game? So it goes beyond the 100 pence, uh, which was an incredible play, by the way. But how do you, you know, make that part of... Um, you know, the vernacular. It's only one of our broadcasters, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think Randy Hahn is the only one who's even on Twitter um, right now. They don't tweet. They're old school guys. They, you know, especially the baseball teams, they're, they're so entrenched in America's pastime and I uh, want to preserve the quality and the tradition of the game. So 
um, inviting a technology sort of advancement into that space, it's not a, it's not an easy thing just because of where sports has come from, that sort of traditional tribalism of it. And this will sound a little ironic coming from me, someone that's focused on investing in innovation. You know, something that we always advise our companies not to get wrapped up in Silicon Valley, which is to say, we're not the masses. We are not representative of this country or this world. We are a little microcosm in the way that we embrace technology, the number of mobile devices that we can, that we use. So the rest of society will get there. We just have to appreciate that we're thinking about things on a very different plane. This is what we live and breathe every single day in, you know, middle America, I'm not picking any areas, this is just not what's near and dear to their heart. So we just have to be very pragmatic and realistic in the way that we imagine the world to be, and it's not necessarily going to happen as it's happening here in Silicon Valley. Great. Um, all right, so probably the last question, and then we'll give you guys some time to ask, so get your questions ready, audience. Um, so we talked about this uh, a little bit, uh, or Carlos started talking about it, sort of. So what is life look like in the future? So, you know, 10 years from now, um, you know, keeping in mind that what if, uh, I think Josh Hoppelman or some like uh, luminary VC basically had a graph and it showed like what we talked about, the 10 most popular sites. And I think nine out of one created 10 years ago. And then I think this was for e-commerce, but we used the same thing. If you looked at like, um, you know, the 10 most popular media brands, you know, New York Times, and, like that 100 year old sold and broadcast networks are too. Um, how do things look differently for TV and video and sports media 10 years from now? And we can kind of go down the line on that. Oh, I can start, sure. I, top of mind, I think regulation comes into play uh, where, again, the audience is going to find a link to a bootleg game and you can just stream it and find something. But uh, Chris and I were talking about this. I hope it didn't stay with under Chris. But, um, so the sort of arm that you know the FCC has the, with the cable industry and how that stuff is regulated and how fines are, are doned out, but it's really the wild wild west is gonna it's gonna stop <laughs> eventually, and it's gonna get more corporate and more regulated. So uh, outside of Amazon drones coming to deliver your you know <laughs> your TV to you or um, having an opportunity for you to play third third base, um, you know maybe there's something there too with virtual gaming. I don't know. Um, but the regulation to me sticks out as something that broadcasters and video, in particular, um, it's going to be a big thing in the future. I think we see a world of greater fragmentation and specialized content for much, much smaller demos. Um, you recently see that on YouTube and there's channels that attract a very small population, but it's very targeted and very tailored to that population. So I think we will definitely see that. I think content consumption across a plethora of devices will only increase and there will be many more devices that we have access to. Uh, wireless connectivity, we've historically talked about wireless as its own separate category. Wireless is just any other physical layer as cable, as DSL, as, as any other connection point is. And all devices will be wireless and that's just the way the content is delivered to them. But the way that we engage with those devices will evolve and, can, and the way that we consume content will evolve. I think the metrics will get better. I think measuring audiences on certain devices and or televisions will get better. And I think you'll have like an act, I don't know if you subscribe to it or whatever, but you'll know when your fans or your viewers are most active on your site instantaneously. I know we could kind of do that now, but I think you know this, this segment right here wants this type of content. So you'll be unbelievably strategic with your content distribution. So they get this kind of content. This group over here likes this kind. Zip that to them. I think it's you know fragmented and or maybe even more specific. So I think as content producers, we're going to have to get really savvy with the way we structure what the, that content is and who it's going to. Now it's you know it is like Jen said, the wild wild west. You know, and the people, the, the masses are the gorillas, and we're the zookeepers throwing all the food. And the food can't be enough. But I think at some point there'll be somewhat of a you know a tipping point. Or, okay, I like this kind of, okay, well, then we got to do that for you. That's just my guess for the future. If anyone knows, then let's line up. Let's, let's start a company. You know? It's unbelievable, the possibility. Uh, I don't know what will be uh, TV in 10 years. Uh, but one thing I know, and I would be very productive you know, with that, but uh, it's my case. You know, so I can't, I can't do it. 
I think that TV as today doesn't make any sense. Really. I mean, it's a little bit of that. I mean, you have to show it at exactly the same time, watching exactly the same channel, you know, to watch the same thing. And when it becomes interesting, we're going to cut this experience and we're going to bring commercials. And if you like this show, we have to wait six months to, to see it again. That's what is TV you know, today. This is going to change. I don't know in which way, but I promise you that the videos, the digital guides, are going to change that very soon. This is my bet. Because this doesn't make any sense. Uh, great, all right. So Q&A. Uh, in the corner? Uh, in TV, yeah. Um, question on, there seems to be a, we're in a point in time of sports and television where there is a, there is, it's right for disruption and the incumbent players such as the big Time Warners are fighting such companies as Aereo and, you know, who are gatekeepers and no offense but the mentality of we're the zookeepers and we throw out what we want to the, to the masses. I mean, as the masses that are consuming the, the content, as masses, I think that we should control the content more than having gatekeepers and zookeepers throwing out the content. No offense to that, just, just make a point to that. But what do you guys see? There's a, there is right for disruption, I see, but maybe the, the, the media rights and the regulation, especially in the cable industry, is stalling that possible disruption that technology can implement right now. Just love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, what do you mean control the content? What, what do you mean? As far as um, the technology today is available for media consumers, sports content consumers to control uh, the angles that we want. You know, the oh, like literally the angles of yes. the specific the micro, line? Yeah, the audio feeds that we want. The technology is there, but as a, as a consumer, I feel that the gatekeepers are protecting that because they're fearful of disruption. And I think that they're, they're fearful of that seeing the music industry. I think it's a really tough <laughs> problem to solve because I think there are so many constituents involved. There are the rights owners, uh, there's the FCC, there, there are so many constituents in that. Um, there are some very ingrained business models that depend on that. Content production is very, very expensive to produce. High quality content, as we talked about, is getting cheaper, but it's still really darn expensive to produce a feature film or produce original content. So. Unless that changes fundamentally, I, I don't know how that could evolve. Um, I think consumers certainly voice and, and speak with their, uh, what are that saying, speak with their money, but um, there have, some radical changes have to be made in the way that content is produced because economically it just won't work. I guess one thing that, uh, maybe to add to that, and sorry to steal a question from the audience, is uh, that uh, we're hearing a lot about Google buying NFL rights, and I expect we'll hear similar rumors about, you know, other big tech companies with a lot of cash, like Amazon and Apple, um, and we'll see how protected those leaks are with their rights, but it seems like that could be interesting to see how sort of companies come from kind of a different perspective and paradigm deal with those rights. You know, um, from a content <laughs> provider standpoint, we're a little bit unique because we are owned by a cable company as well. so. Um, understanding that our primary job is to overserve the service, you know, I have to make our our product attractive not only to consumers first and foremost, um, real brand equity and, and have people come back to us, but um, it's ratings and it's um, you know revenue that comes in from sub fees. If I don't have those sub fees, then we don't get to pay for the rights for these teams. If I don't have to pay the rights for the teams, then I don't get to put it on television. If I can't put it on TV, then I can't put it on mobile. So I think uh, more and more, especially with the authentication mo model of TV everywhere, where you have to put in your credentials. So at the very, very minimum, if you have a cable subscription and you get our channel on TV, then you can watch our games online. It's slow. It's totally slow, but at least they're moving in that direction where you know you can't get the extra stuff along with it. Um, but it's a service that you know you're still going to have to pay for because, uh, like Dave said, business models and all the muckety muck stuff that you hear. We'd love to be able to give it away for free, but that's just not viable in this um, ecosystem. Um, okay, uh, right here in the front. 
Thanks. Um, uh, I didn't hear anything from you guys about wearables as one question about how mobile is going to uh, sort of invade uh, lots of things you won't wear, which is really only a sort of a subset of the Internet of Things, which is where everything's going to have like, an operating system and interact. Uh, it seems like some of the Carlos you were talking about was, was why not have a mobile uh, product at the, on the living on the couch with you and interact with the TV that's also got a computer chip that can do special things. So I'm wondering if there's a way Thanks. I mean, because uh, at lunch, you know, we were talk I, I was talking with the product guys and you know, the team, and one of them, you know, came with a crazy idea of creating like a fuel band, you know, for TV viewers. I, I thought it was a very good idea, but in a way, I don't know. We we don't have the money, you know, to make it. You know, maybe if you guys want to pay for it, you know, to make it a, a conversation, maybe. But yeah, I think that you should wear TV. Maybe. You know, I mean, that maybe you. You will not you know, watch TV, of course, you know, but imagine a few band that alerts you when your favorite shows are on TV, or maybe uh, give you what is your level? I'm a Game of Thrones level 89. You know, you're the Game of Thrones you know, level 47. You know, I beat you. I'm better than you, etc. And where that? You know, me I can show you my know, level in Game of Thrones. Wow, it's a crazy idea. But yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I think you're right. You know, you we have to think this way. You know, I mean, uh, we have to think you know, out of the box. You know, what is very, very difficult to in the TV space, by the way. But uh, but yes, I mean that uh, we need to bring innovation and think in a in a new way and try to find uh, uh, maybe what sounds you know stupid ideas you know today won't be you know, so stupid you know tomorrow. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you see any uh, investment you know, right now with crazy ideas like this that came to you or? Yeah, we, we were investors in a company called Body Media, it was a wearables technology that Jawbone acquired, and uh, Jawbone has obviously had a lot of success with their up bracelet. Um, I think we'll see a lot more innovation in the capabilities that up bracelet and Fuel and, uh, and Fitbit and all these other companies that have wirelessly connected devices that people interact with, they share a tremendous amount of personal information with, how that evolves and how did that carry your personal identity going forward and how to use that for the authentication. We'll see, I, I think it's a very powerful platform. Are any of your companies contributing in any way, uh, opening up your products to open source developers? Is there anything you guys are doing in that? The giants, there's so many statistics you guys can be providing. There's so much stuff you can be doing to developers that we can go better on to. Is any other open source that you have to pay for everything? The rule. <laughs> We're governed by Major League Baseball. You know, we can't go rogue and provide those type of things. It's called MLB BAM in, in, in New York. So, um, yeah, we don't even oversee our own site. We populate it with content, but it goes through New York and then out. So, yeah, I mean, creative ideas. There is, also, uh, you know, so many statistics with baseball that are, you know, obviously very creative when they're wide. I can't speak on behalf of Comcast, not, not my uh, pay grade. Um, there is a big Comcast uh, Silicon Valley office that just opened not too long ago. They're investing very heavily into innovation. Um, I think they, they will make progress in that, I, I, outside of my ability to speak on that. But I think your point is a good one with data. It's another thing that kind of excites me in that space. That you know, it's traditionally been so monopolized, whether it's Bloomberg or stats, and you know, how do you, how do you capture some of that enhanced information that people really want? Um, we, we're asking ourselves that same question. We pay just as much as you know anybody else does. Um, so if it's data specifically, it's a video specifically. It's all about you know, if we're going to give this up, if we're going to open it up. How do you then get that? Um, I'm in from Boston, just came in today. So your point, John, you guys are way advanced compared to us on the East Coast. So it's just fascinating being here. Uh, just one comment and one question. Um, I think we're looking at something, oh, sorry, I run a sports marketing agency on the East Coast. I know we're looking at what's going on with the Olympics and the World Cup. Because if you look at what went on in London, it was pretty amazing that the ratings for NBC were so strong for content that had already played online and digitally earlier in the day. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Russia in February. So I don't know where that's going to go. But my question to you is about the in-game experience. 
So a lot of talk there. How do you see what's going on with fans in the stadium or participating in sports, tying back into technology? Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, that's another half of my job is I didn't oversee the in-park entertainment at the ballpark. So uh, I cringe a little bit when handheld devices are brought up because obviously we want you focused on, you know, we want you to have fun and tweet and do all that stuff, but we want you to enjoy our entertainment. You know, I mean, we want you to enjoy the kiss cam and participate and all that. And, you know, hold on a minute, but not and that. But no, to tell you, um, the in-park entertainment is very compelling because, you know, is baseball, you talked about it earlier, about is it a lean-in experience, you know, is it a lean-back? Baseball is a conversational, traditional game. And it's fun to sit there and enjoy a conversation with your father, like he did with his father, and, and so on. And, you know, so we, we draw a fine line between, you know, bombarding our friends, do this, do that, do that. You know, we want to make sure that it's, it's it presented in a way that's very natural and flows with the ball game. What music is being played, and our graphics, and our videos, and everything, we want you to just enjoy the experience and not have to do too much thinking. Obviously, we have social media components. They're everywhere. You know, we have a social media cafe in left center field. So we are taking care of our fans. But you know, I have to draw a fine line about entertaining and you know bombarding them. And I think we do a pretty good job of that with the Giants. We take it very seriously. And we talk about it all the time. You know, how do we integrate sponsors so it's not offensive? And, you know, just to make sure that everyone leaves that park like they're leaving it's the greatest experience they've ever had. Because, you know, not to sound corny, but I will, we're creating memories, and that might be that young kid's first game there. So we have to draw a fine line with not too much technology, but just enough to satisfy those that are so savvy in this area. But at the same time, when you go to the stadium, everybody's on this form. You, you watch it. Everybody's maybe trying to deal with the Wi-Fi. That's going to be true. Oh, we have great Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at and <-T> Park. <laughs> You're the boss sometimes no. <laughs> when you go to the state. And, uh, and uh, yeah, no, but everybody's on this phone. As, as you were saying, you know, you're creating memories, but everybody wants to share you know, these memories sure. with others. You know? And uh, you were saying it's something very interesting. Yes, I mean, it's a social experience. You want to talk with your father, but maybe your father is in Boston. And how do you talk to him about the show here, the game, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And, and, and everybody wants to view their phone, you know, when they go to it's not it's not fun, you know, with your entertainment or with your game. That doesn't mean that they don't like, you know, what the game they're watching. It's just that they want to share it. That's right. because they love it. No, no, but what I was saying is I don't, we don't the wanna, reverse. We don't want to tell them tell your friend or your your person in Boston or your person in Tennessee. They can do that. They will do that. We just have to yeah, draw a fine line. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. But we don't want it like, oh, uh, uh, you know, we, we gotta okay. make sure it's a natural progression right. into the overall entertainment plan. That's all. Okay, a couple more quick ones. Uh, all right, back left. Yeah. So to touch on your point for in-game in-game advertisement and uh, ROI for sponsors, what have you found that works for sponsors that is that uh, touches on ROI? That they, could, that they can produce on the mobile level uh, that brings them more more eyeballs than just an advertisement in the stadium. You know, if you look at left field, you have you know an Adobe sponsorship. What could, have you found anything else, or has anything been brought to your attention that brings more value to the sponsor and creates an interpersonal relationship between the Giants, Adobe, and the fan? You know, no, that, that's. And it goes back to how many bodies are coming through the turnstiles. Our ballpark, we're very fortunate. We've had over three million in the last few years. That's just basic math right there on ROI. Right. But into the digital space, you know, it gets more complicated because what I have explained earlier that our digital space is governed by the league, not individually with the Giants. So we have to be careful walking that fine line. You know, we could, you know, to Jen is our primary broadcaster. They're our rights holder. So we could say that on 75% of the replays, your signage was seen by X number of people above and beyond the three million in the fan, in the ball. <laughs> so there's those, and then how many impressions are online based on MLB replays. You know, so there's a, a very complicated uh, ROI analytical thing that our sponsors do, but you know they, they keep enjoying it and they keep coming back. There's a lot of permanent fixtures. There's signs that rotate. So. 
It's not my area of expertise, but I do know enough to at least say something. Right. Yeah, uh, my name's Mark. I, I'm working with uh, Boxfish uh, in Palo Alto. And thanks very much for the uh, for the plug. Um, uh, there is a rumor that we're only hiring Irish. That's not true. Uh, I, know, I know we're smart, but we're not that smart. Um, so if anybody'd like to have a chat afterwards, I'm around. Thanks very much. Yeah. There is a rumor also at Core that we only hire French people. That's not true. <laughs> okay. uh, questions? Uh, um, yeah, back. Uh, Back me or right, back. Okay. Big one. Okay, so um, so one of the things I like the most about sports, I come traditionally from social gaming. I did a bunch of Facebook games, and I think that now there, um, if you look at what's flooded in the actual space, sports is wide open for disruption, right? Like traditional stuff being made in social games can be applied to sports. That's kind of why I'm looking at it now. Um, I actually co-founded a company with Joe Montana, so we're looking to do segment between sports, but bring social gaming into the actual element. So when people are consuming your content, you can actually get them to pay. Right, so I think that's interesting. Have you guys seen anything that's like social gaming? You know, we all made a bunch of money on Facebook and on mobile, but right now mobile is so wide open of mobile sports for something for like the next Zynga of sports. And like MLB is the number one app that makes the most amount of money. It's the top grossing. And it just shows videos. You pay money to show videos. So have you guys seen anything out there right now that's like pretty awesome that they're coming in the space to disrupt it? Well, we don't know if it's awesome yet. <laughs> but we've uh, uh, partnered with FanDuel um, most recently, and uh, I'm really curious about that space. But those are daily fantasy, though, right? Yeah, That's like the legally, like, what do you guys think about that? Like, it's daily fantasy, right? <laughs> That's like legally sort of, uh, you know, DraftKings just got 24 million, like, like the daily fantasy is kind of interesting, like, is that where you guys are like, because that's kind of legally kind of, for, you know, taboo a little bit, right? Like. Are you guys seeing that the Daily Fantasy stuff is going to be awesome? And yeah, like I said, I don't know if it's awesome yet because yeah. we haven't really dove in head first. We're starting very slowly with Daily Fantasy. Um, the problem is I don't want to combine my editorial with um, the possibility that somebody's allegedly betting on a game. Um, I'm in addition to a, a television programmer, I'm also a, a, a journalistic entity where I've got beat reporters that are traveling and uh, we're supporting things like breaking news. So. Um, it's a huge question on where you blur the line with advertorial and how do you market to that audience. Um, I think there's something there, and I think it's a lucrative space. Um, as a publisher, I'm just a little, you know, cautiously optimistic about how it's presented. Um, all right, last question or two. Uh, all right. Yeah, um, first question is, Carlos, do you actually have a TV subscription? <laughs> And it's a compound. <laughs> <laughs> at home or here? Uh, I know. Yeah, I've got a TV subscription at home. Every month I'm asking myself, you know, if I want to steal the phone, because I'm just watching six or seven channels, and I've got 700 channels that I don't care about. And uh, yes, it's Comcast. Uh, I keep, you know, my uh, subscription because internet, uh, mainly. But yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, uh, why TV is not like my iPhone, where I can choose, you know, the apps I want, you know, on my iPhone? Why I can't choose, you know, the channels that I want, you know, on my, on my Comcast, you know, and just pay for the channels, you know, I want to watch, you know? I'm, I'm okay, you know, I'm okay to pay, you know? I mean, I, I think that they're very stressed, you know, the TV space because they don't want you to stop paying. But I think we have to say to them, you know, we're okay to pay. That's not a problem. I'm okay to pay 200 bucks in a month for my TV set, you know, but I just want that you know, to be like my iPhone. I want to put my channel. I want to get my experience. I want to engage with my friend. And uh, by the way, I think that Comcast is doing pretty good things, you know, with this Xfinity you know, stuff, etc., etc. But come on, continue, you know, the good stuff you're doing. You know, and let's go, you know, where. So I've got a follow-on question to that. That's that's actually a good point. Um, so what are you guys doing to kind of unify that mobile versus digital experience to, you mentioned YouTube earlier and how it's capitalizing on some of your business. So what, I mean, obviously I, I'm a Uverse customer, sorry, um, but what are you guys doing to improve my ability to watch things on demand YouTube style uh, while simultaneously keeping my mobile experience synchronized with that? So I'll, I'll jump in there. So Comcast actually doing a tremendous amount of I'm affiliated with Comcast, but if you look at TV Everywhere, 
and the carriage rights that have been amended to allow viewers to consume their content outside of the Comcast DMAs. Um, that, that was a tremendous effort. Comcast working with the content industry changed those rights because there's a well-established industry and you know why you can't pick a la carte. There's some very fundamental reasons in the way that content is produced and the way that Disney licenses its content. Um, so that there, there are some sound reasons why that is the case. Um, and it's not just Comcast doing. Um, but TV Everywhere uh, enables Comcast subscribers to access their content linear and on demand anywhere they go. Uh, Cloud DVR is something that will launch in the very near future by Comcast. So if you report something on your DVR, you could access that from any mobile device anywhere you go. They just announced uh, linear streaming on your mobile device. So you could be, you know, you could have your subscription in Boston and you could be in San Francisco and watch the Red Sox play. Um, that was a tremendous leap that the industry as a whole, between the content producers, the distributors, had to overcome in the way that content was licensed historically. So there are, I think, a lot of uh, developments that are happening in that space that will continue to improve the experience. Uh, there are I don't know, a number of Comcast video apps that are available. You can program your DVR, you can change channels, all from an iPhone. Uh, so there are, I think, a lot of those developments being made. All right. Um it's about 7.50, so uh, every big round of applause for the panel. Yeah. All right, finally, thanks so much to our sponsors, Quarter, Thuz, and Yahoo Sports. I hear some of those companies and a few others are hiring. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Hang out, have a drink, and uh, thanks a lot.